sitting in a lecture at nine o'clock, at ten o'clock, you can you maybe do Literally on the other side of that glass. Uh, but do not do this week. This is for the next hour. Okay, okay thanks. Okay. Thanks to all the audience who follows our broadcast. We have the honor today of having Dr. Michael Lawton. Dr. Lawton is the president and CEO of the Barrow Neurological Institute. He is professor and chair of neurosurgery and chief of neurovascular surgery. Right now at the 2021 IWBNC, Dr. Lawton is going to share his lecture, Brainstem Cavernous Malformation Surgery. Please type right your questions in the Q&A panel. We will read them after the end of Dr. Lawton's intervention. Welcome, Dr. Lawton, and thank you. It's all yours. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Are you seeing my screen now? No, it's not yet in white screen mode. How about now? Yes, sir. Now it is. Okay. Well, thank you for the um, invitation to be part of your webinar. Uh, it's a real privilege, and uh, thank you for that. So, um, for the next uh, 40 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about um, surgery for brainstem cavernous malformations. Um, this is um, a topic of uh, particular interest now. Um, as I work on uh, my next book. Um, it's basically a um, summary of an experience here, which you can see uh, over a thousand cerebral cavernous malformations, uh, nearly 300 of those being in the brainstem. You can see um, quite a few spinal cord cavernous malformations uh, over the years here. So um, the book is called Seven Cavernomas. It's in progress. Um, the uh, objective is really to develop a taxonomy for um, 
not only um, surgical approaches, but also for the, uh, the lesions um, to really define these uh, individually. Um, another goal is to advance tissue sparing approaches through subarachnoid spaces, which is really what um, vascular neurosurgeons are all about. It's uh, using the spaces that the brain gives us and navigating those spaces to our fullest potential so that we can get to these targets that are really quite deep. Uh, also of interest is to see how we can um, apply uh, AI and uh, machine learning technology to help um, enhance our surgery approaches, uh, and that's an ongoing project. The uh, metaphor here is, uh, like for all my books, uh, I like to have a metaphor. Uh, for this one, it's maps. And um, if uh, you look at this picture, this is the, the headlands in Marin County outside of San Francisco, where I was for 20 years. And uh, off in the distance, kind of in the very top of your screen is San Francisco. And if you wanted to try and get from this point here to uh, my then office in, um, at UCSF, you know, you would uh, have a hard time. You'd go through a number of valleys and um, you could easily get lost. You could end up in the ocean. You could end up uh, on the other side of the bay. Um, and it's very helpful then to um, rely on these. These are maps. Uh, and from that wilderness, you can identify these trails that have been worked out and you can put together these points so that you get from um, point A to point Z uh, or your final destination. Um, it's a concept that we've all gotten really used to. Uh, we do it with our uh, cars when we drive now. It's um, <laughs> almost embarrassing how even though uh, we, we know these streets and we drive them regularly, we continue to rely on our navigation systems to um, find restaurants, to find people's homes, um, and we don't use our, our brains as much, um, but we, we've become used to this idea of using um, these maps and road marks and uh, landmarks. Some of the tenets for um, brainstem and cavernous malformations or cavernous malformations in general are these, um, maximizing subarachnoid dissection, using the arteries as your landmarks, uh, relying on anatomical triangles to get you into the safe corridors, knowing your surface landmarks, uh, understanding the landmines, the nuclei and tracks that lie below, um, the idea of uh, trajectory and uh, how you line things up, this concept of safe entry zones where you can actually go into tissue safely to access the lesion. Uh, there's the resection technique, problems of recurrence, and then finally, um, uh, it's, a, it's an area where um, you know, we can uh, innovate and explore. Um, the uh, field of cavernous malformation surgery is really one of um, innovation and exploration. So I just want to touch on some of these tenets here briefly. Um, the first is segmental anatomy. Um, this is a paper that um, I wrote with the late uh, Al Roten. Um, and uh, what we were trying to do in this was to complete this um, segmental uh, nomenclature for the entire intracranial circulation. Uh, he had done a nice job with these um, uh, cerebral vessels um, and had named some of the cerebellar ones, but we put together these alphanumerics so that we can essentially have a code for all of the different segmental addresses. And these codes are really helpful because um, if you think of the arteries as those red lines on the map, um, the arteries then become your, uh, your trails and they help lead you through the subarachnoid spaces to your target. So a lot of um, what cavernous malformation surgery is, is um, relating the lesion or the target to the arterial anatomy and then putting together the best uh, sequence of approaches to get to that um, point on the arterial tree. The um, idea of triangles is really important as well. This is a view into the carotid cistern. And when you look here, um, you know, what strikes all of us is the beautiful anatomy with the arteries and the cranial nerves and the skull base, bony prominences. These are what we study and learn. But um, um, I think from, from the surgical standpoint, what we need to think about is the different corridors that uh, these structures create. And so when you look at this, but then think in terms of triangles, then 
you, you see different things. You see these different corridors that you can then focus on and knowing what lies within each of these triangles and how to maximize the exposure within each one is really an important uh, idea here. These are examples of triangles, some of the ones that um, I use frequently and had written about. Um, here we have the carotid optic triangle. Here, uh, number two in blue is this carotid ocular motor triangle. We have the super carotid triangle here in orange. Uh, and then over as we move to the ACOM complex, we've got the pre-communicating triangle, the junctional triangle here, which is great for ACOM aneurysms, particularly those that project superiorly and posteriorly. As we move over to the right of the screen, you can see here this ocular motor tentorial triangle, which I call the bypass triangle because for posterior circulation pathologies, um, the P2 segment and the S2 segments, these are really nice uh, recipient sites for bypass. The pica uh, triangle here is the vega, vago accessory triangle formed by the vagus nerve, the uh, accessory nerve, and the lateral border of the bella. That triangle gets divided into the infra and super hypoglossal triangles for access primarily to pica aneurysms, but also for other pathologies down there. Um, moving up, you can see here the GCT or the glossopharyngocochlear triangle, which is between the ninth and the eighth nerves for lesions that um, are, are higher up and uh, in the region of the pons. And the more we look, the more we find uh, there are the um, extracranial triangles like um, uh, these suboccipital triangle, the, there's the supermeatal tri Troutman's triangle, all kinds of triangles to the point where if you put them down like we have here uh, in these tables, you can see um, triangles everywhere in the intracranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, cavernous sinus, posterior cranial fossa, uh, really an endless uh, variety here. So um, triangles take us to surfaces of the brainstem and these are some of the surfaces and what these illustrations just show you is the amount of exposure in colored area here that you get with these various um, surgical approaches. And so for the orbitozygomatic here, you can see brings you to the peduncular and interpeduncular surfaces. A petrosal approach gives you the entire uh, anterolateral and lateral surface of the pons. And as we look at other surfaces here, you can see what the far lateral gives you and what the posterior uh, approaches, the supracerebellar approaches give you. And down here, some of the um, suboccipital and uh, telovelar approaches. The idea of safe entry into the brainstem is, I think, controversial. Um, some would say that um, these are uh, safe entry points where you can go through normal tissue to get to a lesion. Others would say that uh, you pay a price anytime you go through this tissue. Um, and I think um, um, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, there's some of these zones that are remarkably tolerant, others that are remarkably intolerant. And um, uh, really for this surgery, what you're hoping for is that the lesion comes right uh, to the surface so that you don't have to go through much tissue at all. That's the ideal uh, approach. But these are some of the uh, safe entry zones that are talked about and um, very useful to keep those in mind. Now, um, the uh, decision about um, whether or not to operate is really um, the critical part of the management. And so um, what we did years ago was to develop a grading scale for the brainstem cavernola. And uh, you can see in this table here, the different um, uh, variables that go into that. There's the size uh, and you get points for whether it's less than or greater than two centimeters. Um, there's crossing the axial midpoint, which is really an attempt to get at eloquence. You know, the, uh, the, uh, a lot of the critical tracks are towards the center. And so when you cross, when the lesion crosses that axial midpoint, um, it, it's really the equivalent of eloquence. Um, DVA, um, yes or no, um, point for presence because you've got an obstacle to worry about and the compromise of a big uh, venous trunk can be uh, costly. Age is a factor, uh, below 40 or above 40. And then finally, hemorrhage. It's divided into um, uh, three different grades, acute, subacute, and chronic. 
with the acute ones representing those that have some hematoma that you can exploit um, that will help separate the lesion and create some working space within. Subacute is a little bit tighter. You've got liquefaction, which is still very helpful, but not quite as um, um, large as uh, what you get with a, um, a hematoma. And then finally, when it becomes chronic, all of that advantage that you have with the space and the fluid is lost and you get gliosis and scarring, which can make these things uh, more difficult to separate. And you can see the different point assignments here. It's very much like uh, what we do with ABM grading. Uh, and we arrive at a total here that ranges from uh, zero to seven. And um, this is a, um, uh, a table from the original paper that we did. Um, just looking at uh, outcomes. And you can see that um, we had very few um, uh, patients that were high grade, grades six and seven. Um, but it was suggested that you could draw this line between five and six as your cutoff for surgery. Um, well, we, we've since put together a much larger series of um, patients, uh, mine and Dr. Spessler's. And you can see for yourself here the numbers. And um, what this does, uh, this is just showing the distribution of patients uh, by grade. But if you look in this one here, what you see is that there really is a fall off in the outcomes. These are patient outcome by either a poor outcome or good outcome, or if in this table on the right here, outcome is expressed relatively in relative terms as uh, same or improved or worse, worse being in purple. And what you see here is a definite uh, fall off in outcome as the grade uh, goes up. And uh, you can see that um, uh, what is acceptable is really uh, anything that's grade five or below, and that's about a 20% or less morbidity. The lower grades, which are what I call grade zero, one, and two, uh, have very uh, good outcome profile. Uh, the intermediate grades are the um, grades three, four, and five. Uh, and you can see there's a, a fairly uh, linear relationship here. Uh, and finally here in the high grades, the sixes and the sevens, um, we have morbidity that uh, in my view is just uh, not acceptable. And so these are the ones that we uh, tend to uh, manage more conservatively. So the um, brainstem cavernoma grading scale is really quite uh, useful. Uh, you can see uh, here's a receiver operating characteristic curve that shows an accuracy here of uh, 0.73, which is really what you see with um, Spetsner Martin grading scales or my supplementary grading scale, scales that are commonly in use for ABM. So this is comparable in terms of accuracy. Now, um, the uh, surgical corridors, one way to think about approaches is just in terms of the corridors. And um, these are a way of thinking about these. There's the Gyra and sulci for uh, cerebral lesions, the convexity lesions. And then the brain gives us these other corridors, the sylvian fissure, the inner hemispheric fissure, the ventricles, the tentorium, the petrous bone, and the foramen magnum. These are subarachnoid spaces that we can get into and exploit for our um, surgical reach. And, um, and these form the basis for this approach taxonomy. Um, these are the different categories of the cavernomas. I uh, think of them in terms of um, brainstem, midbrain pons, and medulla, the deep lesions in the basal ganglion thalamus, and then finally the more uh, superficial or convexity lesions, which are the cerebrum and the cerebellum. So those are the, uh, the namesake for the seven cavernoma book. Um, I'm going to just show some case examples to just uh, take you through. Uh, some thought process and, um, and teaching here. This is a, um, uh, a woman who presented with um, a right homonymous hemianopsia. She was found on imaging to have a midbrain and thalamic cavernous malformation. If we apply our brainstem cavernous malformation grading, it's a grade three with points for age and points for subacute um, hemorrhage. It was small. It was not crossing the axial midpoint and uh, did not have a uh, venous malformation. So for this, what we're going to do is a torcular craniotomy and a uh, contralateral supracerebellar transtentorial approach, um, which you can see the abbreviation. Here are the films. If you look at this closely, um, let's start over here at the coronal. 
when you look at this, you would say, my goodness, it's uh, on the lateral border of the thalamus. There's no uh, surface where this comes to. And how am I ever going to get there safely? If you look at the axial, you can come to the same conclusion. You've got thalamic tissue on all sides here. Uh, the insula is really quite thick on the lateral border. Doesn't really appear to be reachable. But if you look here, all the way to your left, what you see is that the quadrigeminal cistern is nicely um, imaged here. If we follow that around into the ambient cistern, you can see that the lesion comes right to the under surface of the thalamus, right at the lateral geniculate body. And so this is um, a uh, cavernous malformation in the uh, uh, geniculate portion of the thalamus that reaches up. And so for this, uh, what, what I chose is the contralateral supracerebellar transitorial approach. What you see in this illustration is um, that the standard midline approaches get you to lesions here, just in the pineal region. But if you're trying to get laterally here um, into these uh, more lateral thalamic territories, then you need to create a cross court trajectory. You need to start over on the opposite side. You need to cross the midline, and then you need to reach into that gutter of the ambient cistern to reach the lesion finally. And um, not only that, if you look here in this coronal, uh, you need to kind of start low and ascend high. There's also uh, this three dimensionality to this. And so um, it's important to do this in the sitting position. So the sitting super cerebellar approach is really uh, ideal for this. And you can see how uh, with this arrow, we start on the opposite side, we cross the midline, we get into that um, space of the ambient cistern where the geniculate body forms the roof of the ambient cistern there. And that allows us to climb up into the thalamus and reach the lesion. It requires this um, transtentorial incision that frees additional lateral mobility. You uh, bring the occipital lobe into view. You can see posterior cerebral artery coming into view. And um, with that relaxing stitch, it becomes a transtentorial approach and we can get higher up. Uh, here is uh, now the, uh, the video. Uh, this is just showing the uh, sitting position. Midline incision, just like, just like that. Um, the uh, craniotomy is a torcular craniotomy because you want to expose the sinuses and get all the way up. And then here you see that uh, incision in the um, in the tentorium. So um, this now is uh, the view interoperatively. Um, I released CSF from the cisterna magna and uh, here is just some of the initial steps getting over the uh, cerebellum and into the um, uh, into the pineal region. You can see this is now just a straight midline approach and you can see how far off of the axis of the midline this lesion is. So we've got to keep going um, we can uh, bring these loops of PCA into our field. You can see the occipital lobe here. This is the edge of the tentorium. And just by following that quadrigeminal cistern forward into the ambient cistern, we can see the bifurcation here of the PCA, and we can work our way uh, further forward. So now uh, this next step is the incision in the tentorium. And by removing um, that constriction, you can see now we've changed our angle. Here's our cross court uh, trajectory. That's our contralateral exposure now. And as we do that, we gain access to this view to the lesion. You see how now our trajectory is crossing. We've gotten right to that point where the lesion comes to the surface. And right below this little layer of tissue, right in here, we get to the lesion. So um, it's a long reach and you need to exploit your angles, but you can see that once you've arrived at the target, um, it gives you a nice clear shot. I've got perfect access, nice clean view, and now I can um, do my dissection and, and get this thing uh, removed. So again, this is uh, with me in the sitting position as well, um, patients in the sitting position, and uh, it gives us this great view upwards into the thalamus, and we can Take this thing out piece by piece. Here's a nice big chunk coming out. And uh, it's a really nice approach. This is what we look for at the end of a case. Nice clean gliotic margin. We've got uh, 
uh, normal thalamic tissue on all sides. We've got no evidence of the mulberry, and we've reached the very deepest portion here on the um, on the uh, stealth imaging of the uh, cavity. So you can see how gravity drops the cerebellum. That cut in the tentorium opens our window, and we've extended all the way up. Here's the postoperative um, MRI showing a clean resection cavity and uh, the patient as well. Now here's another one. This is midbrain and thalamus. Um, this patient uh, presented with right hemiparesis and a um, left third nerve palsy. Um, the uh, imaging showed a midbrain and thalamic cavernous malformation. And um, the uh, grading here was a uh, four point for size, point, uh, two points for age, and a point for, um, for bleeding. So it's a bifrontal craniotomy. We're gonna do a contralateral, transcolossal, transcoroidal fissure approach. And uh, this is kind of the, uh, uh, the way we're gonna go at that. So um, we're gonna take this green arrow here. So here's the imaging. Uh, you can see um, it fills the uh, third ventricle. Um, it, bow, it bows into the third ventricle here. And I think what makes this challenging is that as we come down that inner hemispheric fissure, we've got uh, quite a bit of lateral uh, extent here. Um, it goes all the way into the thalamus on that side. So here we are. Um, so this is the left side, uh, left, left side of lesion. So we've got the left side up. That means the, um, the nose is um, over here and the uh, back of the head is um, to your left. And now uh, we're doing our inner hemispheric approach. This is the um, callosotomy. This is the foramen of Monroe, choroid plexus here. We're at, right at the venous angle. You can see the septal vein here, the thalamostriate vein here, and the uh, curve into the internal cerebral veins over here. This is where we're looking right at the tinea, tinea fornicea. We're dividing this tributary of the septal vein. And by taking that one vein, you can see that allows the venous angle to fall downward. The venous angle falls down um, towards um, the, uh, the thalamus. And now we, uh, we get into the third ventricle. And as we get into the third ventricle, um, the uh, cavernous malformation comes into view. So here um, you can see the uh, malformation is, is right on the wall. I'm using my sharp dissectors to kind of pull this thing away from the thalamus and down into my surgical corridor. And again, um, you want to use um, gravity to kind of pull this thing downward and deliver it into your working space. So um, let me just accelerate here a bit. So this is uh, now some of the uh, pieces of this coming free. It's a nice big piece there. And you know, as we work through this, we get to the bottom of this thing. We start to see our clean gliotic margins here. And um, here, this is a beautiful view. We're looking down on the basilar trunk. So. Um, this is the uh, this is the top of the basilar artery here. I've gone through the floor of the third ventricle. We have a nice view of these perforating vessels coming off of the trunk, right in here. This now is a nice uh, view inside the cavity. You can see how deep it goes. It goes all the way down to the midbrain. And as we inspect, uh, we don't see any uh, additional lesion there. You just see. Our uh, widened frame in Monroe here. This is our internal cerebral vein. You can see the um, back of the third ventricle here. This is the atrium and uh, occipital horn going back in this direction. You can see the um, choroid plexus wrapping around. And you can see how gravity has really helped us open up this inner hemispheric fissure. So, a nice example here of the um, gravity assisted interhemispheric transcolossal transcoroidal fissure approach. And if we uh, look at the postoperative imaging, see a nice clean resection cavity and uh, this patient went on to do quite well.
All right, uh, next patient. This is a, um, another patient with a midbrain uh, lesion, progressive left hemiparesis, disconjugate gaze, um, and a lesion located in the midbrain thalamus. Uh, by grading, this is low grade, it's a two, one for size and one for subacute bleed. Our approach will be a retrosigmoid, uh, but we're gonna go lateral, uh, supracerebellar, transtentorial. So here we are with the MR images. You can see as we look at this, um, we've got some options here. You could make a case for going from the front through the peduncle, um, but uh, you can see uh, just how high this is. I think the upward reach on that would be difficult. Uh, you can see how this really um, comes to the surface on that posterior lateral midbrain surface. And so that was the, um, the uh, approach that I uh, selected here. Um, you can see its relationship to the tentorium quite a bit higher. Um, so um, the uh, approach is again, the sitting position, like what I showed for that contralateral approach, but um, uh, we're gonna take it all the way extreme lateral. Uh, so um, we're gonna come in from the side here, we're gonna find uh, the fourth nerve and we're gonna work our way uh, upwards, supra trochlear. So um, here's the uh, view. This was a, a re-operation. The patient had had a, um, a tumor and needed a shunt. You can see that shunt being displaced. Um, this is the uh, approach in the supracerebellar plane. There will always be these little arachnoid granulations in the corners. You've got to free those up, and that gets you deeper down into the ambient cistern here, which we're coming on. You can see the tentorial incisura up here. You can see um, nice dissection into that plane. This is the cerebello mesencephalic fissure. You can see the basal band of Rosenthal, fourth nerve. And by uh, dissecting that arachnoid, we're dropping the fourth nerve. We're finally seeing some hemosiderin staining here on that lateral midbrain surface. And here we're gonna do a transtentorial extension because this went so high. We're going to incise the tent, cauterize the tent, take care of any venous channels within it. And as we cut all the way through, we're mindful of the fourth nerve, but we um, break that barrier. And now you'll see that um, the tentorium kind of folds out of view. And we can extend our reach upwards. So here I'm climbing into the attic of that ambient cistern, freeing up some of these vessels that are in that space. And now as I climb more superiorly, we see that this lesion comes out of the midbrain. It's actually exophytic at this point. You can see a nice bleb that's worked its way through. And now we have our entry point. No longer any need to go through normal tissue. We can go through the lesion itself. So our safe entry zone is actually through the lesion and that gets us right to the interior of the lesion. So um, uh, here's just uh, the stealth view showing the trajectories. Um, you can see we're right over the cerebellum. We're pretty lateral and uh, it's taken us to that, that uh, plane that we want. So these sequences are just, um, you know, working the malformation free, pulling it into our surgical view. You can see all of these circumflex perforators and penetrating perforators in the midbrain here that we want to try and carefully preserve. But uh, as we go, uh, we're just bringing this up, doing a piecemeal resection, taking out this very large lesion bit by bit until we get to the uh, gliotic borders here. So um, more resection here, more pieces coming out and now as we near the end, uh, what we're seeing here is um, final pieces and normal gliotic tissue here at the depths. So you can see how the descent of the cerebellum with gravity is a huge aid. And um, again, um, uh, those little maneuvers like cutting the tent and freeing the adhesions and dropping the cerebellum, they all uh, help us achieve our end, which is a uh, complete resection with no harm to the patient. 
this is a, a midbrain, another midbrain lesion to show you the orbitozygomatic approach. This is, I think, uh, more familiar to everybody because we use this uh, as our approach to basilar aneurysms. Uh, I like the orbitozygomatic because it gives you a wider view and uh, great light. Uh, here's the uh, lesion here. You can see it comes, not only comes to the surface of the peduncle, but swells the peduncle. And so uh, just like we do for a basilar, we do an orbitozygomatic, we do a nice uh, wide splitting of the sylvian fissure here, separating the uh, frontal and temporal lobes. We come down on the optic pathway here. This is uh, going around the nerve and chiasm, releasing CSF from the lamina if need be. This is now the third nerve. And so the triangle here that we're going to work is uh, actually lateral to the third nerve. This is the carotid ocular motor triangle that I'm in now. You can see the posterior uh, clinoid here. But as we deepen this dissection, we're going to transition lateral to the third nerve. So this is all arachnoid within that cistern. We're now lateral to the third nerve. The SCA comes into view underneath. The PCA is up above, and you can see how this malformation kind of pushes forward out of the peduncle into that triangle between the SCA and the PCA. Lateral to the third nerve. So the triangle here is the ocular motor tentorial triangle between the arteries. So you can see the uh, lesion coming into view. I'm going to um, just accelerate this to show you um, portions at the end. You can see how important it is to um, use traction on these uh, lesions during the dissection. It helps you to see exactly where points of adhesion remain. Uh, but uh, in the end, you want to slowly work this free. You want to um, identify these points of adhesion, break those up. And finally, um, you know, in the end, uh, this thing works itself free. And there it is, comes out uh, in one large piece there at the end. It took a lot of work to get there, but by preserving as much of that capsule as possible, um, you uh, ensure that you get all of the, uh, the lesion. And here, this is just an overview at the end, showing you a nice view of the basilar apex. We're now in a different triangle. This is the carotid ocular motor triangle. Basilar bifurcation is up here. Perforators are up there, and you can see that nice trans Sylvian corridor that, uh, that gets the job done. Um, now, the next one here is um, the transmittal cerebellar peduncle approach. This is a real workhorse for us. I'll show you this case. Um, it's a high function executive. She came in with left facial numbness. Um, uh, her grade was a three, two points for age and one point for DBA. And again, as I said, um, middle cerebellar peduncle approach. And you can see this uh, resides right in the lateral pons. And the MCP is really one of those safe entry zones that I believe in. And you can go in here laterally and uh, really do a nice job at uh, getting this free. So uh, the technique is the extended retrosig, splitting of the petrosal fissure, uh, using that um, lateral safe entry zone through the middle cerebellar peduncle and making sure that you get the right trajectory. Here is the ex extended retrosigmoid. What I mean when I say the extended is not just your typical crany uh, burr hole at the asterion and turning the crany that um, may be nowhere near the sigmoid, but actually skeletonizing the sinus, getting right along its edge, taking that dural flap all the way forward and uh, maximizing what you can in that uh, cerebellopontine angle. And why that's important is because if we just come in from the back here, through a traditional MVD approach, um, you end up kind of skirting the lesion. What you have to do is you need to change or rotate that trajectory downward, which means sort of pivoting at this point. And um, the way you do that is you get as far lateral on the middle cerebellar peduncle and enter at that region. So looking at the um, anatomy, this is the cerebellar pontine angle. You can see our petrosal fissure here is between where the superior and inferior lobes come together. The flocculus sits right there in between them. And you can see here in a cadaveric specimen, that peduncle occupies this little triangular space here, lateral to the pons. And what you wanna do is you wanna split that fissure and get as far lateral here so that your entry point 
is back in this region here. And as you do that, um, you can really um, get the right trajectory to the lesion. So here's the case. Um, our sigmoid sinus is up here. Our uh, transverse is over here to your right. And this is the splitting of the petrosal fissure. So it's just like the sylvian fissure, the branches of Ica are in that fissure. This lady had a particularly nice one, so we can do, or I can show you this nice wide uh, fissure split. And as we split that fissure, the DVA comes into view at the depths, the branches of Ica here come into view at the depths, and at the very bottom of the fissure, we uh, start to see the, the penumbral. Here's the fifth nerve. This is the DVA up at the top. And here's our angle. You can see how the angle isn't quite right. And what we've got to do is we've got to spin it more, uh, which means actually opening up more of the fissure laterally to get to this point. This is about as far laterally on the peduncle as you can get. And when you get to that point, you see how the angle changes. We now have a clear shot inward directly uh, in line with the lesion. And that's what we want. So we want that kind of a view. That's where we make our dive. We go through the peduncle. And as we deepen up, we finally get to the malformation here. So it's about a centimeter of tissue. So we, we have to believe in that safe entry concept here. And in fact, um, I can vouch for it. It's uh, really quite good, quite uh, non-eloquent. And um, here we finally um, pierce the capsule. We evacuate contents of blood within. And uh, this particular malformation I can show you um, is a nice one. I can free it up uh, cleanly, get all of its adhesions broken down. And in the end, you see um, here, it comes out very nicely as a single piece, which is what we like. Um, when it comes out like that, as a single contained piece, then um, I'm confident that I've gotten it all. And again, here the, the navigation tells you that we're at the very back portion, the deepest portion of the capsule. We're staring at clean gliotic tissue on all sides. And that tells me that, uh, that we're done. We preserve the DBA, we've entered laterally, we've avoided the descending corticospinal tracts, and uh, uh, we're in good shape. Here's just a tour showing the nerves, the fifth nerve up here, DBA here, tentorium is over here, branches of the SCA are over here. Beautiful anatomy. And here's our uh, post-operative view. You, you can see how um, that entry point is really far laterally, used it to get right to the lesion, and a nice clean cavity here seen on the T2 imaging. Um, so, uh, let's see, I think. I will, um, well, yeah, I'll show you this one. This is an inferior peduncular cab mal. This will be our last case because we're getting low on time. Uh, but um, this one, you can see this one is uh, in the inferior cerebellar peduncle. It's not in the MCP, but it's in the ICP. And uh, the, um, the approach that we're going to take for this one is um, um, a uh, a different one, it's a, a Tilo Vila approach. And so um, uh, here's our grading. You can see points for, um, uh, let's see, points for age greater than 40 and for subacute hemorrhage. So for, um, I'm sorry, for chronic hemorrhage. So a total of four. So for this, um, here's our approach. We do a suboccipital craniotomy. We uh, work the tonsil laterally. We incise the um, inferior medullary vellum. It gets us into the lateral recess and right down to the, um, uh, to the lesion itself. So here now is the view interoperatively. You can see that beautiful arachnoid of the cisterna magna, which we open here. The tonsils are uh, in full view. You can see the floor of the fourth. Um, branches of pica run alongside or above the inferior medullary vellum. And just by cutting that, away and 
holding the, the, uh, the tonsil up a little bit. We continue to march along this inferior medullary vellum. And as we continue to go, we start to see this uh, hemosiderin stain right there. We enter that and you can see that um, our lesion here comes out nicely. This is um, right where the inferior cerebellar peduncle arcs under the, I'm sorry, over the uh, lateral recess and into the cerebellar peduncle. And uh, we work this free. It's hiding in that little corner and we can see a nice uh, piecemeal resection here. And so uh, slowly we get to the bottom of this thing and uh, uh, we get the job done. So um, let me uh, wrap this up. Um, so um, I think with uh, these brainstem cavernous malformations, um, you covered a lot of things. Um, there's the issue of um, Pro, um, whether or not to operate. And I think the grading scale can be a useful uh, guide for you. Uh, obviously the patient's presentation is very critical. Um, but then the next big question is approach selection. This is just a summary of um, all the various options for midbrain lesions. You can see the check marks. Uh, those designate the, uh, the real workforces, the orbitozygomatic transsylvian being one, the bifrontal transcolossal transcorridal fissure being another, the lateral supracerebellar infratentorial approach being another, and then finally the um, uh, midline supracerebellar infratentorial. A lot of this depends on the lesion type and um, you know the um, where the lesion comes to the surface. But having in your mind this menu of surgical approaches is very important. When we switch to the pons, there are um, more choices. It's a bigger part of the brainstem. We have the uh, trans cerebellar pontine angle cistern approach. We have the trans middle cerebellar peduncle approach. We have the suboccipital transventricular approach when the lesions come to the surface of the fourth ventricle, uh, the floor of the fourth ventricle. And uh, we have the far lateral, the trans pontomedullary sulcus approach. Uh, great for the uh, lesion that's located right above the olivary nucleus. So these are our four workhorses for the pons. And then finally, in the medulla, um, fewer choices, um, but much easier access either through the ventricle, transventricular, or through the far lateral approach if we need a more laterally directed transsternal approach. Um, so um, to sum this up, I think patient selection is the secret. Uh, candidates must have uh, hemorrhage and deficits. Lesion must be on the surface, on the pia, or at the uh, appendimal surface in the ventricle. Um, your approach selection is critical and you need to make those decisions carefully. Um, enter safely if it's not right there on the surface using those safe entry zones. Um, an intracapsular resection, I think, is far superior than um, piecemeal resection. So you want to try and go for that um, capsular preservation and on block resection if possible. And lastly is this idea of the fine line. Um, there really is this fine line going for a complete resection where you get all of the lesion and have no recurrence, uh, but harming the patient going too far in essence, versus not going far enough where you leave behind a small remnant and it recurs and bleeds again and has uh, the problem of requiring more surgery. So there really is that fine line. You wanna try and go for um, a cure, but you always have to balance the um, drive for a cure with the, uh, the need to do no harm and not to uh, um, push things so far that you end up giving patients new deficits. So it's 946, um, that's 45, 46 minutes or so of lecture. So I'm gonna um, uh, stop my screen share here and turn this back over to our moderator. Okay, thank you Dr. Lawson for this wonderful lecture. We have a few questions from the public. 
first question is, uh, how much laboratory training time would you recommend for neurosurgery residents to spend before starting vascular micro neurosurgery? Yeah, so I think the answer to that is the more the better. Um, I think uh, time in the lab is incredibly valuable. Um, I can tell you that um, in America, we have a year and a half for research that comes in the fifth and sixth years of our residency training. Um, I really was committed to um, using that time to spend in the lab. I um, did some scientific work that um, was very surgically driven. It was a, a rat arteriovenous fistula model for um, studying dural arteriovenous fistulas. And almost every day I was doing bypass surgery, connecting the carotid artery with the internal jugular vein. And so I was developing my microsurgical skills. Um, I was doing cadaver dissections. Um, uh, you know, I think the more time that you spend learning the anatomy, developing your technical skills, um, developing a comfort with the instruments and the, uh, uh, the drills and all the things that are part of our surgical armamentarium, the better you are. And uh, there's no better place to practice than in the lab where you don't have to worry about bleeding. You don't have to worry about consent forms. You don't have to worry about angry patients if things don't go right. Um, so it, it's really uh, um, an amazing experience. And I would say that um, the more time you spend there, the better surgeon you do. Okay, thank you. Another question. In thalamo, mesencephalic or posterior thalamic cavernomas, what critical aspects do you recommend for choosing the surgical approach? When do you consider contralateral, supracerebral, or infratentorial? Yeah, um, well, uh, I think um, I'm, I'm trying to make this very easy for people um, in, in the book as uh, uh, these papers are going to start coming out very soon. And you'll see, um, I think the, the first step is to just identify which lesion it is. And if you've got a lesion like that one I showed you that's a, a geniculate body lesion in the thalamus, that, that identification of exactly where it is almost tells you the approach. And that specifies the contralateral supracerebellar transtentorial approach. Whereas if it's in the midline, if it's a quadrigeminal lesion instead of a geniculate lesion, then you know that you're going to use a different approach. It's just going to be a supracerebellar midline approach. So, um, you know, I think uh, understanding the taxonomy uh, as, it, um, as I get it to you uh, will be helpful. But uh, in the meantime, you know, other things that people have been using is like the two point method where you draw a point where the lesion comes to the surface, you draw a second point in the center, and you look at the trajectory of that line and see which approach lines up. You, you can use that as a rule of thumb or a guide. Um, but in the end, um, there aren't a lot of uh, little tricks that help you make these decisions. And so um, it takes a lot of judgment and study to see you know, what the specifics of the lesion are and what the specifics of the approach that you're, you're considering are how they all match up. Okay, thank you. We're looking forward to reading your new book. So uh, another question, what, what's the advantage of using contralateral approach for thalamic lesions? Yeah, I think the advantage is, was in that diagram where you could see that if you were to stay on the ipsilateral side and go straight in, you don't get the, the, the lateral reach, you know, what what you're trying to get for that particular case was to get further out to the side and get all the way around that lateral part of the lesion. And, um, you know, sometimes if, instead of thinking so linearly, if you think circularly, if you wanna get to one side, you have to move yourself or rotate yourself to the opposite side. And it's, it's that kind of thinking. You, you gotta go contralateral to get more lateral where uh, you're trying to see the lesion in the, on the hardest or deepest corner. And that's the whole, that's the whole justification for it. That yeah, makes sense. Okay, um, how much time do you use for surgical treatment after an episode of bleeding for in, in a patient that you would take to surgery for a brain cavernous malformation? Is time a fixed variable? Yeah, so um, I think um, it's a good idea not to operate in the hyperacute phase. Like if a patient comes in with the bleed today, uh, you wouldn't want to do surgery tomorrow because 
the brain stem will be swollen, the, the clot will be firm, and um, it might even be difficult to see the cavernous malformation within the clot. But if you wait a week, wait two weeks, you know, in, in, sometime within that zero to three week acute window, um, I think um, uh, any time in there is, is perfect timing because then, you know, you've got um, a liquefied hematoma, the um, um, cavity that that hematoma creates for you is at its maximum size and you can easily drain the blood. When you get in there, you can find the lesion and it really facilitates things. Um, you do still get benefit up to eight weeks. Um, I think the benefit starts to dwindle because that, that uh, space that you're working through starts to get smaller. If it was this big initially and it starts to liquefy and reabsorb, it's, it's that gradually diminishing. And so um, you wanna catch it in that window before it goes away. Um, so to answer your question, you know, I, I think wait, waiting one week is, is probably a good idea after the um, initial bleed. Um, but then any time thereafter is good in that first to third week. Okay. How much time do you usually uh, spend during these surgeries? For example, for a transcolosal approach for a brain cavernous malformation in a basal ganglion. Yeah, well, um, the nice thing about cavernous malformation surgery is that they're not long uh, surgeries. It's not like an AVM where you can work away for six hours and um, um, still have more work to do. Um, you know, the, the actual resection of a cavernous malformation is usually fairly brief. Um, you know, once you pick your target, um, it takes anywhere from a half an hour to an hour or so usually to, to do all of the work to get it out. Um, the approach itself can, can be lengthy. You know, um, if you're doing a contralateral transcolosal transcoroidal fissure, you've got a inner hemispheric fissure to dissect. You've got the ventricular dissection to do. Um, that, that can take another hour or so. Um, extended retrosigmoid approach can take an hour drilling the sigmoid. Um, so it really just depends on um, the approach that you pick and how, um, how quickly you get through it. Um, but the actual resection portion usually is not so long. Okay, thank you. Is vasospasm a concern during subarachnoid dissection? If so, how do you manage it? It's not a concern. Um, the arteries are your landmarks, but they don't, um, um, they don't go into spasm. You know, if you uh, think about subarachnoid hemorrhage and aneurysm surgery, yeah, those arteries have um, been bathing in, in subarachnoid blood and are hypersensitive sometimes to manipulation, but these uh, arteries are not. They're um, pristine. They haven't been exposed to blood. Um, they handle manipulation fine. And uh, I don't worry about um, uh, them going into the spasm. I think um, the advantages that you get from them as landmarks are really important. And so you should use them. Okay. Do you use cranial nerve tractography as guidance for cavernoma resection? It can be very helpful. Like um, anytime you're going through parenchyma to get to a lesion, like for example, with a um, pontine lesion where you're going through the middle cerebellar peduncle, um, it, it can be useful to look at tractography to see exactly where the corticospinal tract is or where the medial lemniscus is. Um, th these can be helpful. Um, uh, I, I find that like anything, you know, when you start doing aneurysm surgery, um, you feel like you need a detailed angiogram for every case. And after a thousand or a couple thousand of these things, you just, you just know it and you don't even feel like you need the angiogram anymore. Uh, I think the same can be said in some ways about, um, these approaches, you know, like, um, going through the middle cerebellar peduncle. Now I, I'm so comfortable that I'm behind that corticospinal tract. And if I use my entry site properly and I, uh, uh, have mapped it out, I, I don't necessarily need the tractography, but I think for good measure, it's useful um, if you have it to, uh, to, to get it, to look at the relationships and make sure that they're not pushed in an unexpected way. Okay, another question. Are DVAs that are associated with cavernomas always crudely seen 
on the pre-op MRI. Have you encountered cases where you found a DVA at surgery next to a carbonoma that you were not expecting? And if you inadvertently damage the DVA, especially in a brainstem carbonoma, is it going to be a disaster? Yeah, um, so I think um, there are some DVAs um, that you can easily see preoperatively and that one uh, extended retrosig transcerebellar peduncle approach that I showed you, that was a great example of um, a DVA that you could see on the MRI preoperatively and you could see interoperatively uh, without any trouble. Other times, um, you're right, they can be small, they can be missed on, a, on the MRI. Um, the key is to look for them on the T1 gadolinium sequence. And um, on those sequences, they light up pretty well. And you want to not just look for the trunk, but all the little fingers. You know, I like to think of it as a hand. And, you know, you can see the trunk, but uh, you also want to see where the fingers are wrapping around the lesion. Because as you go through the capsule, you want to try and preserve it. I think the key, though, to answer the second part of that question is you, you need to preserve the trunk. And if you kind of compromise or sacrifice a finger, um, it's not a disaster. It's just, it's gonna be fine. Uh, but if you compromise the trunk, um, then that could be a disaster. So you wanna really be protective of the trunk part of the venous malformation and uh, do what it takes to keep that safe. Okay. Uh, the last question is, what is the role of radiosurgery in management of deep-seated carinomas? Yeah, controversial topic, but uh, my answer to that is no role. Um, I think um, stereotactic radiosurgery, radiation therapy in general, uh, has no role to play in the treatment of brainstem cavernous malformations. The morbidity is too high uh, because you're radiating the brainstem. Um, the efficacy of that therapy for cavernous malformations is low, if anything. Um, the reason it works for AVMs is because you're radiating arteries. Radiation to arteries causes the smooth muscle cells in the wall to thicken and sclerose and close arteries down. There are no arteries in cavernous malformations. There is no smooth muscle cell response. Uh, and so there really is no reason why radiating these lesions would have any beneficial or therapeutic effect. So it hasn't been recorded well. Some have said that the bleeding rates go down just a little bit, but Frankly, um, I think there's just as many studies that show that that's not the case. And so my feeling is that um, it's not um, um, something that should be offered. We don't, we don't offer it and we actively discourage it. Okay. Well, on behalf of CN, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Lawton. This has been a wonderful lecture. We are really grateful and honored for your participation in the 2021 IWBNC. Thank you for having me and good luck with the rest of your conference. Thank you very much. Now for all the audience, keep in mind this lecture will be available on our website starting next week. In a few minutes, we will have Dr. Michael Levy doing his lecture, Pediatric Cerebrovascular Disease. To get the link for this upcoming conference, please follow the link pinned on the chat screen or check the program schedule on our website, cnhus.com. Thank you. <laughs>